The King of Comedy. This is my favorite Scorsese movie, and weirdly enough, it's not a gangster film, which you know is a speciality. As much as I love movies like Goodfellas and The Departed, The King of Comedy stands out to me more, and the reason why is due to the protagonist being more complex and developed. I love Rupert Pumpkin as a character. He wants to just shine through his skills in comedy, or at least the skills he believes he has. The guy lives in his own fantasy, believing that he's best friends with one of his favorite comedians, Jerry. And not only that, but he also fantasizes himself being the best comedian in the country. Now, obviously, the Joker took a lot of inspiration from this movie, which I don't have a problem with, but I still feel like the King of Comedy did this story better than the Joker. The tone in the Joker is that everything's depressing, everything is sad, but in the King of Comedy, it's kind of open for interpretation. Like, you could laugh with this guy, you could maybe feel sorry for him, but it's not trying to make you feel sad. And that's one of the main reasons why I prefer someone like Rupert over Arthur. I feel like Rupert is a much more realistic character. Everything in Arthur's life did not go his way, and I feel like the movie The Joker was trying way too hard to make everything super depressing. And again, I like The Joker. I've said this many times. I think it's a great movie, but in my opinion, I think the king of comedy is in another tier. <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise. So, I've only seen two reincarnations of The Phantom of the Opera, obviously one being this movie, one being the 2004 version, and the other one being the 1962 film, and I thought those two were okay. However, Phantom of the Paradise is a different story. It is stylized to the max. I love the character designs, I love the atmosphere, I love the music. Everything about it just looks and sounds amazing. My favorite song and scene from the movie comes from Jessica Harper, who sings special to me. It's just one of those songs from movies I can listen to by itself. While this film is pretty dark, it's it's also a comedy, and it has a lot of underlining meaning about the music industry and how you sell your soul if you sign a contract with them. And the way they portray this is so over the top, it's comedic, but at the same time very gritty and eerie. But honestly, I enjoy the campiness. Up front, the movie doesn't take itself too seriously, but when you discover those hidden meanings behind the movie, it becomes more than just a simple, campy 70s film. Alright, so for this spot, I have two movies, both that I believe are incredibly underrated. First, we have The Road to El Dorado, and then The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Out of these two films, I feel like The Hunchback has definitely gotten more praise throughout the years. It's definitely become more appreciated. It's personally my favorite Disney movie, due to how mature it is. The movie includes religious fanaticism, lust, attempted genocide, but the two things I really appreciate from this movie the most are the characters and the music. Claude Frollo is such a fantastic villain, I love Quasimodo as a protagonist, Esmeralda is a good love interest, even more of the side characters like Clopel and Phoebus are great too. The music makes everything feel more grand, despite the landscape of the film already being incredibly large. Now on to El Dorado. Does this film have deep or complex morals? Not really, but that's why I kind of like it. It's just simple. And despite the movie just being simple, it's still very entertaining. The movie makes up for it for its great story, fantastic music, and its amazing characters. They're very real and filled with personality. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is just something so simple, but it's when the chief discovers that Miguel isn't actually a god. It doesn't turn into this whole dumb liar reveal story. The chief accepts his fib because this lie was able to take away power from the priest. And the chief and the priest during the movie are going back and forth on who actually owns El Dorado. As a bonus, none of the animals talk in this movie, yet they also have their own distinct personalities. Just little stuff like that makes me feel like this movie is unique in its own way. Terminator 2 Judgment Day the last decent Terminator film, the other ones don't even come close. And not only that, but it's an improvement upon the first, which is already a very good movie. James Cameron is a decent director, but this is his magnum opus. I really can't think of one bad thing to say about this movie. I, I think it's perfect. The characters, the story, the action, the effects, I think it's all perfect. Now, I've seen some people complain that it's somewhat too similar to the first movie, and I kind of agree, but they change it enough where this film can stand on its own compared to the first one, because, you know, instead of a grown woman being hunted down by a Terminator. Now it's a stronger Terminator hunting down a kid who has a Terminator bodyguard. And that Terminator bodyguard was the antagonist of the last film. I mean, it's a great concept. I also like how this movie integrates CGI. During this time, it's still very new, but to have the main villain be made out of liquid metal, that is a very smart way of not having the effects like gimmicky. Can't stress it enough, one of my favorite sequels of all time and one of my favorite movies of all time. Harakiri. This is the first samurai film I've seen, and it still remains as my favorite. I do really enjoy films like Seven Samurai, but this one's in a different tier for me. You know, with Seven Samurai being such a classic and such a hit, we have different forms of media copying the premise, and unfortunately, because the premise has been copied multiple times, I already knew what was going to happen. That's not the movie's fault, but regardless, that's what my experience was. Harakiri, on the other hand, it goes in different directions, it's unpredictable. The main protagonist, Hanshiro, is a great fucking character. He embodies everything what a samurai should be. And lastly, the 
cinematography makes the movie look like it's a modern day film. It looks amazing. But again, my favorite aspect of this movie is the plot. Typically, I'm annoyed when a story goes in different directions, but the payoff for each plot point is very satisfying. And this is often regarded as one of the best films ever made, and I can't agree more. If you're not a fan of foreign films, I still recommend giving this one a chance. Barry Lyndon. You're gonna hear me talk about Kubrick a lot because I have three other films above this one. And all of them deserve praise. Kubrick is probably my favorite director because he does have that directing style that no one else can do. And Barry Lyndon is a movie that has a certain atmosphere that no other film has really captured. I love the calm, misty environment that it displays. It also ties in dark comedy, and despite the movie being historical fiction, it's very grounded and realistic. I also really like the character of Barry Lyndon. You know, he's not really a nice guy, he's kind of a dickhead. But sometimes self-centered characters such as Barry Lyndon, these type of characters are a breath of fresh air because they feel more realistic. I'm also a big fan of the message of the movie, which is uh, the dangers of class mobility. And yes, that is something we've seen time and time again, but it's the execution of that message that I really enjoy. It's not necessarily that, oh, money can't buy you happiness. It's more, even if you make it to the top, you're still vulnerable. The money part of the movie is more of a tool used to get to that point. It's more about Barry Lyndon's journey in achieving a high social status. Not to mention, this movie has one of my favorite scenes of all time, which is, of course, the final duel scene. I love the anticipation, I love the slow buildup, but my favorite aspect of the scene is witnessing seeing Barry Lyndon's character development. Ironically, once he reaches that upper point of social status, he becomes more humble. Barry realized the torment he put his stepson through and commits a very selfless act. A great ending for a fantastic movie. The Lord of the Rings trilogy. Kind of cheating, but I mean, the story moves in such a cohesive way. It's kind of difficult not to put these movies in the same position. And this is also, I would say, my favorite trilogy just because of how solid it is. I love the Spider-Man, Star Wars, and Godfather trilogies, but each one has their own movie that kind of falls flat, but it's different for Lord of the Rings. Each movie is fantastic and they're all on the same playing field and quality, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're perfect movies. For example, I'm not a fan of how the antagonists are treated. The orcs in each of these movies are jokes. They go out like little bitches every single time they meet the heroes, and these are the main henchmen you see on the screen. Also wasn't a huge fan of how Angmar was taken out. It just sounds stupid that he lost a two basically foot soldiers. I know there was more to it like stealth and the prophecy, but Eowyn cutting off the head of a dragon, that was fucking stupid. Some of you are gonna get mad at me for saying this, but the scene really does remind me of Arya Stark killing the Night King. You can have your little disputes about how it's different, how one makes sense and one doesn't, but at the end of the day, the big bad guy gets killed in one shot because of some prophecy. Well, I guess it was technically two for Angmar, but my point is, villains up to this caliber should not be killed that quickly. So yeah, my only real issue with the series is the villains, but there are a lot more positives than negatives. While the villains are kind of lackluster, the main heroes are amazing. These characters are very enjoyable, they're filled with personality. You actually really care for them in their journey. My favorite character being Samwise. If you want to know more why I like this character so much, you can check it out in another video. And even though I just talked shit about the villains, the character of Gollum is a fantastic antagonist. Frollo, Aragon, Gandalf, they're all very well done. And even more of side characters like Legolas and Gimli add a lot of personality into the world. From a technical standpoint, special effects, score, all that. That beautifully executed. This trilogy is so well put together, it's kind of hard to think of what other series could beat it, or even compete. Lost in Translation. Much like Barry Lyndon, there's a certain feel to this movie that no other movie can capture. The environment of the movie is Japan, while the atmosphere focuses on loneliness, which to me is a very interesting combination. But the premise of this film is very relatable to me because the two main characters, Bob and Charlotte, the location they're in kind of makes them feel out of place, and only they can really understand how the other feels. I've been in similar situations where I feel out of place based off the location I'm in, which causes me to kind of turn my brain off, and Lost in Translation captured that feeling perfectly. You're in a beautiful setting a place that maybe you should be enjoying, but really, you've mentally checked out. Besides the relatable and intriguing atmosphere, this film also contains a lot of great acting, and surprisingly good comedy, and I'm not saying that because I think Bill Murray isn't funny. I enjoy a lot of his stuff, but I thought comedy would kind of kill this film. Fortunately, the comedic scenes don't try too hard, and, you know, they're more there to be kind of a breather. The comedic scenes also complement the pacing of the film very well. Full Metal Jacket. In almost every single one of his films, Kubrick likes to include a lot of dark comedy. And no other Kubrick film shows that better than this one. Typically, I'm not a fan of complete tone shifts. I'm not opposed to the idea, it's just that usually they're not done well. But here, Kubrick takes two mainstream genres within war movies, horror and comedy. We all know the war films like Saving Private Ryan that show the horror of war, but war movies such as Stripes have a more comedic tone, because people enjoy the banter between the sergeant and the new privates. The movie starts with the sergeant yelling at new recruits, basically trying to reveal 
sell itself as a comedy at first, and then it gets dark really fast. There are two reasons why I really like this tone shift. The introduction of this film begins with the perspective of the new recruits, and they don't know the type of environment they're really in, so a more comedic side isn't strange. But once the tone shifts, the soldiers start to realize the position they're really in. And secondly, the comedic parts are not over the top. The film stays grounded all throughout, which allows the shift in tone to not feel out of place. And that's another thing I really like about this movie. It feels very realistic. Not even just the setting, but also the acting. Hartman feels so real because the actor who played him was a real-life drill instructor. Just little details like that add a lot of realism. My favorite scene in the film, though, is when Private Pyle snaps. It's very intense, and it all just feels very real. And that's what separates this horror movie from others for me. The characters and their interactions with each other feel very natural. Nothing seems forced. Not my favorite Kubrick movie, but definitely one of the best. Inglorious Bastards. I've already talked about why this is my favorite Tarantino film, so I'll keep it brief. It's kind of the opposite of Full Metal Jacket, where that movie is more grounded, while this one is very over the top. Both films are historical fiction, but the difference is Inglorious Bastards goes out of its way to completely rewrite major events in history. And you know, on paper that sounds bad, but the difference is Inglorious Bastards establishes itself as a film that isn't trying to be realistic or historically accurate. One of my biggest pet peeves is when a movie that centers around a historical event or a historical figure. They try to make it more cinematic or Hollywoodish, and it just falls flat, but thankfully that flaw isn't in this movie because the film isn't trying to be real. It's its own twist from a real historical event. And now for the other stuff, you guys already know why I really love this film. The story, the characters, especially Hans Landa, who I've said is one of my favorite fictional characters of all time. Personally, I don't have any issues with the movie. I think it might be perfect. The Godfather. I first saw this one when I was 10, so I didn't really appreciate it, which made me kind of reluctant to watch it a second time, but after I did, it became one of my favorites. There were some things in the movie I saw again and still wasn't crazy about, and it wasn't really from a story standpoint or anything the characters did, it was more from a technical standpoint. For example, that scene where Sonny beats up Carlo, there were a lot of air punches, and it wasn't even something you see when you slow down the movie, it was really fucking obvious. And even though the introduction of Mo Green was a great scene, there was one part in it that had really horrible dubbing. These are just two issues issues, but nonetheless, they were hella distracting. Everything else about the movie is pretty much fantastic. I really enjoyed the character Michael Corleone, and he's even better in the sequel, which I will talk about in a little bit, because that one is higher than this one. And even though I did rant about the, uh, the technical issues, such as the dubbing and the choreography, the movie does make up for these flaws with its cinematography and its lighting. I love the dark, grim atmosphere that it creates, and I'm also a fan of the pacing, even though a lot of people find it too slow at some points, which is fair. Schindler's List. So, this is my favorite Spielberg film, even though it doesn't really feel like one, which is probably why it's my favorite, because again, uh, I like Spielberg, but I'm not really a fan of his whimsical movies. It's just so childish and annoying. But here he creates something that's super mature. He doesn't talk down to his audience, he just shows a very dark and gritty representation of the Holocaust, which is exactly what it was. Like, it's obvious he really wanted to create something meaningful here, which makes sense with Spielberg having Jewish heritage himself. I mean, you could just tell he was very passionate about it. At first I thought Liam Neeson as Oscar Schindler was kind of a weird casting choice, but in the end he proved me wrong. I think he did an excellent job as Schindler. I'm not really a big Liam Neeson fan, I mean I'm sure he's a great guy, but in terms of acting I think he's just okay. So to see him do something like this was pretty surreal, it was kind of like Adam Sandler in Uncut Gems. I didn't think he had it in Because him. people like Liam Neeson and Adam Sandler usually play basically the same character every single time. So for them to do something that's completely different and in a whole other league, it shows me more of the passion that came from not just the director, but also from the actors. And it makes me appreciate those films more. Schindler's List is also a film that uh, brings to light a historical figure that many people probably didn't know about until this movie came out. That person being Oscar Schindler, who saved over a thousand people. And to my knowledge, I think most of the movie is historically accurate. The Clockwork Orange. This would be my second favorite Kubrick movie. Originally it was my first until I saw the other one. Again, I love the dark comedy that comes from Kubrick. There's a lot of that in here. It's completely over the top and silly, but at the same time has that horror factor within it. The opening scene of this movie is one of my favorites. At least for me, it really fucking pulled me in. Malcolm McDowell's commentary over the film's score, it's the perfect combination. I've said this before, but Alex is one of my favorite characters of all time. He's very interesting, but also he's got a lot of style going with him. His outfit is iconic and for a very good reason. For me, he left a very strong impression. Very very unforgettable character. I also don't really have any issues with the movie. I think the first half is more entertaining than the second one, but I mean, I still like the second half. Some people aren't a fan of the ending of the film, and I kind of see why. Personally, I enjoyed it. I think Alex quote-unquote winning in the end was well-deserved. He did a lot of terrible shit, but a lot of stuff happened to him to kind of make up for that. And the concept of someone this young being pure evil, it's a very interesting idea. Again, not my favorite Kubrick film, but in the top 10 regardless. The Dark Knight. 
Great story, great characters, and of course the Joker. I've talked about it multiple times on this channel, so I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about a character who I feel like is very underappreciated in this movie, and that's Harvey Dent. I've always wanted to talk about this ever since I saw Doug Walker's old versus new video comparing The Dark Knight and Batman 1989, where he kind of pushed aside Harvey Dent as a character and just said, oh, the, the best side character in any of these films is Bob. You know that henchman no one really remembered? And I know why Two-Face was underlooked, it's because Joker was in the movie and everyone remembers Heath Ledger's performance over Aaron Eckhart's performance, even though that was also spectacular. I mean, shit, my favorite scene in the movie doesn't even include the Joker. It's the ending scene between Batman, Two-Face, and Jim Gordon. I mean, throughout the whole movie I was included to my screen, but this scene alone is so fucking intense and well acted. Even though I would have liked Harvey Dent's character to be in Batman Begins as well, his slow spiral towards revenge was actually well paced, despite it being in one movie. Everyone knows the other stuff I like about the movie, so I'll kind of talk about the flaws. Not a fan of Christian Bale's Batman voice. I know other people have talked about it, but I'm also in that boat. Sometimes the dialogue can be kind of eh. Doug Walker made a good point about how the characters in this movie talk more like critics of the film as opposed to actual characters, which is kind of weirdly true. And while most of the action is really good, the fist fighting stuff is pretty mediocre. My biggest pet peeve with Christopher Nolan is that he does that stupid, shaky camera bullshit when he films fight scenes. It looks terrible and it makes me want to puke, but thankfully Nolan makes up for it with his usage of practical effects. That truck flipping scene it still gives me goosebumps. I also really appreciate how Christopher Nolan can make a superhero movie feel so realistic. It doesn't always work in this movie, but most of the time it does, which is a pretty impressive feat. Again, I do have some issues with this movie, but overall it's my favorite superhero film up to date. Star Wars A New Hope. I really do like Empire Strikes Back, and I know that's a lot of people's favorites, but this one is just more iconic, and it contains one of my favorite movie scenes of all time, which is the binary sunset. The visuals, along with John Williams' music, it's short, but it's a perfect scene. And I don't remember anything within Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi that was on the same level. This movie also has Grand Muff Tarkin, played by the late Peter Cushing, and he is a phenomenal actor. I like how in this movie, he's kind of portrayed as the main bad guy, while Vader is more of his lapdog. And if you read more into the Star Wars lore and universe and all that, he's actually a pretty fucking cool character. The effects look kind of dated. Obviously, it's the first Star Wars movie. It came out in the 70s. But knowing when this movie came out makes me appreciate the effects. Some people think that the Tatooine scenes are kind of slow-paced and boring. And I get that, you know. I, I used to be in the same boat, but I just appreciate how grand the landscape is. To me, a part of Star Wars is just enjoying the atmosphere and enjoying the setting. If I had one issue with this movie, it'd probably be the lightsaber fight between Obi-Wan and Darth Vader. Like at one point, Alec Guinness just kind of does a little spin move, and it looks pretty ridiculous. But other than that, the action's good, space battles are fun. The Godfather Part 2. To me, this is the greatest sequel of all time. It expands the story, it develops the characters, and fixes the technical issues from the first movie. And yeah, the first one does have uh, Marlon Brando playing Don Vito, but I feel like Robert De Niro did an excellent job of holding the role. Even though he's playing a younger version of Don Vito, he perfectly copied the mannerisms of the character. And like I said before, it makes improvements upon the first movie, because here I didn't notice any poorly dubbed or poorly choreographed scenes. So from a technical standpoint, it's pretty solid. And like I said before, Michael Corleone is a more fleshed out character in this one, and I feel like we get to see how much Al Pacino's acting is actually developed as well. There are a lot of moments where his facial expressions just say it all, there isn't any dialogue needed. I love watching this character's journey and building his own mob empire. He learns and adapts as he takes down his opponents. And the ending with Michael is done beautifully. There's a certain contrast there between Michael and Vito. Vito starts out with losing his family, and even to his last breath he has his family, while Michael's journey begins with his family, but ends up being alone. Little details like that just make a huge impact. Spirited Away. I won't dwell on this one too long because everyone knows why this movie is perfect. Although I won't agree that the movie is perfection. Only because sometimes the dialogue can be kinda eh for me. But that's most Mizaki films. He has a problem with show, don't tell. Which is really fucking weird if you think about it because Mizaki is responsible for creating some of the most breathtaking scenes in all of cinema. But yeah, all of his movies have dialogue issues. It's not as prevalent here, but there are still scenes of Chihiro explaining what is happening when it is not needed. It's kinda like the same problem I had with The Dark Knight. I don't think Christopher Nolan is the greatest when it comes comes to writing dialogue either, which kind of makes sense because both Nolan and Mizaki are more into visuals. And speaking of the visuals, I don't really care that the dialogue is iffy at some points because of the visuals. I mean, when a movie is this good, you're very forgiving of the very few flaws that it has, and the visuals definitely make up for it. Nothing beats a sixth station for me. After a rewatch of this film, I'd probably put that scene as my number one favorite. The scene tells a whole story without dialogue, and I love shit like that. All the side characters are filled with personality, they all have their own goals, their own ambitions. A lot of them are pretty fleshed out. The sound 
soundtrack of the film is very strong. It complements the visuals very well. And lastly, I love the message about moving forward and building courage. And the ending wraps up the film perfectly. Eyes Wide Shut my all-time favorite Kubrick movie. There is so much to unpack from this film, and I'm in love with the premise. The film basically shows how sex is utilized as a tool within society, and we see how it impacts certain individuals based off class, relationship, etc. But the way Kubrick displays how sex is utilized within the upper elite class, it's very eerie. The Rothschild mansion scene is, it's fucking bizarre, but I was glued to the screen the entire time, because dark cultish shit like this probably exists, and it's a creepy feeling. I was pleasantly surprised about Tom Tom Cruise's performance, because I've only really seen him in action movies, but after I saw this movie in Magnolia, it became pretty clear that he's capable of doing other roles. Another thing I really appreciate about this film is the tiny details, just one example being at the end, where it's implied that Bill and Alice sold their own daughter into sex trafficking in order to save their own lives. Whether that's true or not, it's not really confirmed. The reason I believe it is is because Kubrick uses two of the same actors that were in the beginning of the film, and it kind of seems like he's hinting at these two were the ones picking up the daughter for the exchange. Again, it's just a theory, but the the fact that the film even sparked up something like this in the first place, it really shows how deep the movie really is. Old Boy This movie contains one of the best plot twists I've ever seen, and I won't hint at anything about it because I'm sure at least some of you haven't seen it before. So if you haven't seen it, go watch it. This is my favorite foreign film and my second favorite movie of all time. But make sure you watch the Korean version, not the American one. Spike Lee, for some reason, bought this movie and just decided to take a fat shit on it. Again, I've talked about this movie before, so I'll try to keep it brief. The story is incredibly intriguing. It's very dark and twisted. The movie is filled with a lot of personality, and not just in terms of characters, but also effects. Even just that one scene of Ode Su holding a hammer over a guard's Head, and we get that effective direction and that little ding sound. Like this film is filled with little goofy stuff like that, but somehow it works. Just the way it's shot too, the film is trying to be serious, but not too serious. There's a lot of great usage of practical effects. The fight scenes are very well choreographed, especially the corridor fight scene, which is one of my favorite scenes of all time. It's a great representation of what a realistic fight would be like. The main character is taken on 20 guys by himself, but it makes sense because they're all compressed down in this tiny hallway. So it's not like every single one of those henchmen can attack Ode Su all at once. I won't say any more because it is really something you just have to watch for yourself. The Prince of Egypt. I have been asked multiple times why this is my favorite movie, and now I'll be able to explain it. This is a movie I grew up with, I've always remembered it. This is one of my favorite biblical stories, and for it to be told through animation, and with the utmost respect, it's really left a big impression on me. Like, Ten Commandments is a good movie, but this one's more memorable. And don't get me wrong, Ten Commandments is a good movie, but this one has a lot more personality, I feel like. I love the relationship between Moses and Remesis. They only have a couple of scenes at the beginning of the movie, but we still understand how strong their bond is. The pacing's beautifully done, I love how this movie looks, and I love every single song in the film. There isn't one that's boring or just kinda there for background music, every single one is worth a second listen to. I was afraid re-watching this movie as an adult because I loved it so much as a kid. I thought there'd be really dumb, painful, stupid kiddie scenes, but no, overall the film's very mature. Like, the most kiddified scene in the movie deals with Moses and Remesis having a chariot race, and even then it's not that bad. I thought it was fine, it never distracted me or took me out of the movie or anything. There isn't any fourth wall jokes, which is one of my biggest pet peeves. And DreamWorks likes to do that shit a lot, so I'm very thankful they didn't put that in this film. All the voice actors do a very good job with their roles. Even though The Prince of Egypt includes some very big names, it still never distracted me. There are a lot of great scenes that look fantastic, and honestly, it could rival Studio Ghibli. Moses splitting the Red Sea just being one of the examples. My favorite scene from The Prince of Egypt is when Moses speaks to God through the burning bush. God is voiced by Val Kilmer, who also voices Moses, the main character, and I feel like he does an excellent job establishing this presence of God. He shows his aggressive nature while also showing his calming and forgiving nature. That also being complemented with beautiful music, it makes for an excellent scene. And those are the reasons why Prince of Egypt is my favorite movie of all time. 